Now, the rest of the story. Lee was a sportscaster, inasmuch as he recited baseball scores on the air. No real reporting, but anyway, when the baseball season was over, Lee was out of a job, so he went to Harfield Whedon, the program manager, and asked if he could join the regular staff of announcers at KNOW. Harfield told Lee that sometimes it's better to face facts, that he would never make it as a radio announcer. Harfield said, not in Austin, Texas, and not anywhere else. No, he said the best thing would be to find something that he could do well and do that. Lee did not argue. Maybe deep down he realized that what Harfield was saying was true. In fact, he was about to leave the radio station. He was about to embark on the rest of his life, whatever, when he was approached in the hallway by a thin-faced, weaselly-looking little man in a flashy checkered suit. The man said, My name is Fox. And the weasel said, I'd like to make you a proposition. And so distracting was the stranger's appearance and demeanor, Lee had to concentrate especially hard to comprehend what Mr. Fox was saying. I've opened a sports club here in Austin, he said. I'd like to know if you're interested in reading the results of sporting events to my members for four hours every afternoon. Well, he'd never heard of a sports club before. He was about to turn Mr. Fox down when he heard what the salary would be, $75 a week. That's what the man said. Lee was dumbstruck. He could put himself the rest of his way through college on a wage like that, with a fortune to spare. Not even Lee's father made that kind of money. It's a deal, he told Mr. Fox. And the following Monday he showed up for work at the address that he'd been given, it was a run-down office building to begin with. The sports club, so to speak, was on the second floor. Lee was admitted only after being identified through a sliding panel in the front door. He was ushered into a small windowless room in which there was only a teletype and a wooden chair and a microphone. Lee was then instructed to read into the microphone all of the information the teletype printed. "'Where's my voice going?' Lee asked. "'The next room,' Mr. Fox answered, and the young man was allowed to peek into the adjacent smoke-filled hall, which was wired with a public address system. The room was crowded with rough-looking club members, all of them staring intently at a scribble on the blackboard. Lee would not have to ask what was going on anymore. He knew now he had just signed on as an official racetrack announcer for the best little bookie joint in Austin. Well, as it turned out, crime paid well, but not well enough. After two weeks of dodging shadows and sleepless nights, Lee simply didn't show up for work and resolved never to go back. Of course, now he was more scared than ever, specifically that Mr. Fox and his out-of-town goons might hunt him down and kill him to keep him from squealing, and then he would never have a chance to spend his ill-gotten $150 nor to become the broadcasting legend whom you know, whose most notable early broadcast reached only into the next room, for Lee was Walter Leland, Walter Leland Cronkite. And now you know the rest of the story. And now the rest of the rest of the story. Walter Cronkite was known as the most trusted man in America. It's hard to imagine him working in that illegal horse racing gambling joint in Austin. His reluctance to work in such a place around such an element is just one of the many reasons why he became known as the most trusted man in America. But I'm going to tell you another story about another dangerous situation Walter Cronkite found himself in. Back when Walter was an 18-year-old, inexperienced newspaper reporter for the Houston Press, he was awestruck by the Houston Press's senior crime reporter, 37-year-old Harry McCormick. Dressed in the off-romanticized reporter style with his pressed suits and tilted fedora press hat, Harry went to great lengths to get a story. Walter always kept a watchful eye on Harry so that he could learn how to become a great reporter himself. One night, Harry invited Walter out for a beer after work. 
Hungry for any opportunity to advance his reporting career, Walter gladly accepted. Although there were plenty of local places to have a beer, Harry drove them far out of town. They eventually reached their destination. Walter described it as a sleazy speakeasy behind an even sleazier grocery store, if you can believe that. Harry warned Walter to keep his eyes open and his mouth shut no matter what transpired. Harry and Walter walked into the speakeasy and sat at a small table. After a few minutes, a man wearing old dirty overalls and an old crushed felt hat sat down at their table. The man greeted Harry and gave Walter a nod. The man looked Harry and Walter over but said virtually nothing. The man sat just for a minute or two before he got up and left the speakeasy. A few minutes later, at Harry's direction, Harry and Walter also left the speakeasy. Back in the car, Harry asked Walter, So, what did you think of him? Who, Walter asked. Harry replied in disbelief, You didn't recognize Raymond Hamilton? Walter was stunned. He and Harry had just sat down with one of the country's most wanted criminals. Raymond and his associates were responsible for a string of murders, attempted murders, kidnappings, bank robberies, jailbreaks, and car thefts, as well as holdups of grocery stores, gasoline stations, and various other businesses. But Harry warned Walter sternly that he could never tell anyone of their meeting, ever. Late in the evening of March 18, 1935, just a few days after their meeting, Harry stood on a Houston street corner. Ralph Fultz, one of Raymond's partners in crime, pulled up beside Harry and forced him at gunpoint into the car. Ralph drove Harry to an undisclosed location where Raymond cautiously waited. For two hours, Raymond told Harry of his various crimes and his close calls. He told Harry of one particular close call when a policeman fired a shotgun at him and he allowed Harry to feel the bullet fragment which was still lodged in his neck near his Adam's apple. Raymond kidnapped Harry so that the trusted reporter could tell the public the truth about Raymond. I never killed any man, he claimed. Raymond hoped that this lie would garner some sympathy and make the public less likely to turn him in if they saw him. Following the interview, Raymond and Ralph returned Harry to his car. Before the kidnappers left, Harry had Raymond place his fingerprints on the windshield of the car so he could substantiate his story. As the sun rose on the morning of March 19th, people walking by Harry's car found Harry bound and gagged. Before Harry allowed anyone to untie him, he made sure someone photographed him bound and gagged. Harry knew the photograph would draw attention to the story. Police verified that the fingerprints on Harry's windshield were, in fact, made by Raymond Hamilton. Harry got the story of his career, and newspapers throughout the country ran the story. Raymond's lie helped him little as police caught up with him a short time after Harry's interview. On May 10, 1935, Raymond Hamilton was executed in the electric chair at the Texas State Penitentiary at Huntsville, Texas. Raymond Hamilton, if you're not aware of who he is, was a member of the gang whose two most well-known members were killed just a few miles from my house, Bonnie and Clyde. Now, Walter kept his word to Harry for over 50 years, but he eventually shared his secret. He told of his and Harry's meeting with Raymond, and Walter explained that Harry brought him along to the speakeasy so Harry would have a witness if anything went wrong. He also explained Harry's kidnapping. Harry could not interview a criminal on the lam without being guilty of collusion, so he set up his own kidnapping so he could interview one of the country's most feared murderers. Now, Walter's reporting career prospered, and he eventually earned the moniker Most Trusted Man in America. It was he that broke the news to America of some of the most memorable moments of the 20th century, including the assassination of John F. Kennedy, Martin Luther King, Robert Kennedy, and John Lennon, as well as details of the Vietnam War, the moon landing, and a myriad of other important events. 
For more than 50 years, Walter kept secret his and Harry's meeting with Raymond Hamilton, as well as the events surrounding Harry's kidnapping. I guess even the most trusted man in America had his own secrets. I'm Brad Dyson. Thanks for watching, and now you know the rest of the rest of the story.